So my name is Lisa Stone Street and I am the Head of Communication and Charity Impact for the IRIS Foundation and we're actually a registered charity who work in the space of responsible investment. Uh, we primarily work with other charities to help them with their responsible investment policies um, but we've also traditionally done quite a lot of work looking at the retail market for um, ethical finance and ethical investments um, and we try and help provide uh, free and objective information on this space. Um, so as I said we'll, we'll get started quite quickly. Um, firstly we're going to hear from Unicorn Asset Management, uh, Fraser and Simon if you want to kick us off please. Sure, yeah. well, good afternoon everyone, I'm Fraser, this is Simon, uh, we're co-managers for the Unicorn UK Ethical Income Fund. Um, we're acutely aware of Unicorn is a household name and many of you have not heard about us before. So we'll just give you a bit of a background to the business, the underlying process that we apply across all the funds that we run and how we've taken that step further in 2016 to launch an equity fund. Um, so Unicorn is a house, we manage 1.2, 1.3 billion, UK only, long only, um, small and mid-cap focus. Uh, the firm's been around for around 20 years and, and throughout that time, the firm and, and us over the past 11 years have followed the same core process across all the funds that we run. Uh, so Simon and myself together run uh, around 800 million of equity across a small selection of funds. So everything you hear in this first part is, is applicable to all of those funds. As I say, in 2016 we took it a step further um, by launching an ethical version of our, our flagship largest fund, the UK Income Fund. <coughs> so what do I mean in, in terms of consistencies across the fund? They're all, as I say, UK only, long only, small and mid cap focused. All very high conviction, 40 to 50 stocks. Um, all of the very high active share, we take a long-term view across all the funds as well to our trolling period in our income fund, the large fund is, is over five years. So we do like to get to know companies well from the outset, partner with them and invest for the, for the longer term. Yeah, it's that, part of that long-term investment, um, we feel it's fairly aligned to uh, a process within the uh, management of a small and mid-cap focused uh, equity income fund in that we put a lot of emphasis on meeting the management teams we invest in management teams um, that are focused on the long-term outcome for their business. So we, uh, that, that does help align it to um, the ethical process, which we'll, we'll touch on in a minute. Um, we exercise a sort of bottom-up process, uh, but we do also have a, um, have a screening process, which sounds a bit counterintuitive for some business. Um, but that does, again, lend itself fairly well in the ordinary fund uh, to, to a further ethical screening process. So immediately we'll be screening out oil and gas, biotech, pharma, miners. Um, then we'll do some quant screens and then a uh, one of the uh, penultimate part of the process is, is um, looking at the end market, the quality of the end market. Within that, uh, we strip out um, end markets we think are going to be negatively exposed to increased regulatory risk. And those companies within those sectors might well fall foul of, of ethical screening. Um, and so these will be sort of doorstep lenders, tobacco, gambling companies, so they will be in the fund, uh, whatever. And then we'll, we'll touch on the ethical process in a second. But, but within that, we feel we already have a fairly ethical fund in the, in the ordinary income fund as it is. Yeah, so the income fund has 42 holdings. That is our investment universe for the ethical fund. We then run a three-stage process on that portfolio of 42 holdings. Um, two of which are undertaken by MSCI and one is undertaken internally. So the first two steps by, by MSCI, one is a negative screen, um, fairly straightforward, very robust, done on a, a monthly basis. And to be honest, before we send the portfolio to them, we know what's going to get excluded. We understand these, these companies very well. Um, the next stage is an ESG integration. Again, we do this on a regular basis. We get quite detailed feedback from MSCI. And it's a travel like system. If it's a red flag, there's a serious controversy. It's green and goes straight through into the main portfolio. And uh, you know, we, we, we assess what comes back in those reports and, and where necessary, we will speak to management teams and understand that the nature of that controversy and then make a decision on whether it will go into the portfolio or not. And the final stage, which is where five companies don't make it through, is our own assessment. I think we're very lucky and one of the attractions of investing in small mid-cap space is we get very good access to senior management teams of, of almost all the holdings that we have. This is on a regular one-to-one -one basis in our office, in addition to site visits and other industry events. So we get to know these companies fairly well over an extended period. Quite often, companies will, will get through the MSCI screen, which is fairly mechanical, but we'll <coughs> well, we'll understand the nature of the wording on the MSCI screen and, and what we're actually looking to try and achieve with the fund, and we'll take a very, very prudent view in terms of removing these additional five names. Yeah, part of the, um, part of the attraction of uh, investing in very high conviction portfolios getting to know these companies so well and then being smaller bigger is that they are you know, 
tend to be uh, addressing one vertical, they tend to be very transparent. We put a huge amount of emphasis on, on corporate access. Uh, so meeting these teams um, is very important to us. And, and you know, Fraser has just touched on the beginning of the, the unicorn process there, but that, there's no surprise because of that, that, that uh, is the <coughs> largest attrition point within the process that most companies are removed at that process. The majority of those are through military revenues. You know, this is a UK focus fund, so it's going to have quite a lot of industrial exposure. Those industrial companies, um, they might not be as clear as, as, we, as everyone would like with, with uh, the um, reporting of military revenues. It's often quite sensitive, but having a dialogue with these companies, meeting them several times a year, getting them on the phone, emailing them, we're able to find out very quickly the extent of, of, of those revenues for them and the importance of them. So, you know, we're, we're the first of all hands up and say we are a negative screen. We understand we have a variety of different managers and fund houses today. We are negative. Our investment university is the mainstream income fund, which has a very good long term track record. I think we, you know, we're keen to point out that the starting point is actually pretty strong in on itself. You know, it, it, these are very good, well run businesses we've known for a long time, and we just add this additional layer of scrutiny to get to our, our ethical. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and now we'll hear from Neville from Edentree. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Head of Responsible Investment at Edentree. Um, we're part of a larger financial services group, ultimately owned by a charity, which makes us a slightly unusual financial services group, because it means A, all the distributable profits go to good causes. But I think actually that ownership makes a difference in terms of the way we view the world. So the DNA of culture and values in terms of ethical behaviour is kind of ingrained in the way we look at investments. And one of the things I want to talk about in my 10 minutes is really um, where the market is and what I think we're losing and some of the dangers and challenges around that. Um, my colleagues will now be very used to me doing some audience participations. So we've done this twice. The second one was a complete failure. So you've got to be better. Um, we asked everybody to think about, you know, do you feel that this is an important part of the market? important part of the market for you, increasingly you need to be part of and understand. Just put your hands up if you say yes. Gentleman says no, that's interesting. Or maybe just abstaining. And the second question was, okay, that, that follows what's happened this morning. The majority thinking this is, it's vibrant, it's happening, I need to understand this. And the second question, but do you feel confident in actually really understanding this part of the market and what is driving it and some of the language and terminology? Excellent. But the numbers have fallen, and that again is what happens after this morning. And I think that's part of the problem. We saw at the plenary, SRI, ESG, sustainability, impact, norms, the, the range of terms for the vibrant product range is quite extraordinary. So the first key takeaway, given that we're looking, talking to the FCA about regulation and the EU taxonomy, is let's not restrict the vibrancy of the UK market. Choice for the consumer has to be the number one priority. And there is a danger with the taxonomy that that will constrict choice around pure climate change and pure sustainability. But the greater challenge, I think, coming back to my first point about the charity ownership, is we're losing touch with the idea that businesses need to be responsible in order to commend themselves into a portfolio. If we fast reverse to 2000, when the Blair government tweaked the Pensions Act, it kind of created a new style of investing called SRI. And SRI was socially and responsible. But now we've moved fast forward another 15 years to ESG, and all we're talking about is ESG risk, which is as dry as hell. Actually, hell isn't dry, but there you go. And the point is, I think, is that Greta and her friends and the millennials and young people are not talking about ESG risk. They want their money to make a difference, and they want to mitigate climate change. So we have a real problem here in moving away from, I think, the concept of business being responsible to a purely risk-weighted concept of ESG, environment, social and governance. And what I also said this morning is that ESG, when you see them printed, is of equal font size. But actually what we're talking about is an enormous E, a little s of the G non-existent. So they're not even given an equal weighting within fund management. What Edentree does is, and we launched our first screen fund 30 years ago, so we've seen an enormous amount of change and cycles, fads and fashions come and go, and we've stuck to our knitting in that phrase of being responsible and sustainable and believing that you have to harmonise how a business behaves with what it does. So there is a danger in the kind of uptick in excitement around sustainability, and I'm very passionate about sustainability that you could invest in a company that has incredible sustainability credentials, 
but has quite appalling environmental management. I'll give you an example. We recently failed a company, a Belgian chemicals company, where 72% of its revenues come from sustainable solutions. It's got into lots of sustainability portfolios because it looks great. We failed it because its human rights and environmental management are lamentable and we didn't see any room for improvement. That, I think, is where you harmonise the two to get good outcomes. So we have a three-point process in terms of the way we screen companies in. There is a foundation and a water course of, um, a damp course of um, negative exclusions, the kind of absence of harm, which clients keep telling us is still relevant and this is what they want. But it's a very traditional set, alcohol, gambling, tobacco. These obviously wouldn't get into sustainable funds anyway. The second bit is the core part, and this is the ESG and responsibility metrics, where we're looking at how business actually manages and operates. Corporate governance, business ethics, environmental management, human rights. And it's that that will tend to fail a company if it's already passed the negative screens. We then have a discretionary part, which is the sustainability solutions. And we're looking at education, health and well-being, um, and companies purely in the sustainable solutions um, park. Why that's discretionary is because we're general equity and fixed interest managers. We invest across the globe in the general markets. And not all stocks provide sustainable solutions. Not all stocks are transitional circular economy stories. So as general investors, those responsibility tags are really important. But our managers are also looking for sustainable solutions if there's a, a strong investment case. To give you a flavour of how that works, and I think this possibly dif differentiates us from, from other managers, and we had a conversation with, with, with Standard Life about how they do it, um, is that my team sits fully integrated within the investment management team, but my team actually has the final say of whether a stock gets in or not. That's very unusual. Normally, it doesn't happen at Standard Life, but normally um, in some fund manager houses, you know, the fund manager will do the research and he or she is stock selector, judge, jury and executioner. And you can sort of evade some of the ESG issues if you really want to buy a stock. Can't happen at Eden Tree because a fund manager cannot buy physically until we actually allow it. So the due diligence within my team is incredibly robust. It's all peer grouped, reviewed, and we fail around a fifth of the stock ideas that are coming from the fund managers. As active bottom-up stock pickers, we're basically screening ideas, um, 60 to 90 a year, and so far in 2019, we're failing around 20% of those, for very good reasons which fund managers may not have been aware of. We find things which fund managers don't see. That is also a key part of risk management, but also a key part of why this whole market is so important, that actually the ESG um, differential and the strength of that brings things to the partnership with fund managers that otherwise would be missed. Um, we're looking at provisions and liabilities, tax risk and all of those kind of things, which looking purely at EPS and balance sheet and profitability, a fund manager may not be looking at. So my message is um, we'll probably have a conversation about the challenge around language. We have to get better at it. We have to work with you in order to support clients to understand that their money is making a difference, that sustainability is a challenge, um, and the greenwashing and the mislabeling is going to contaminate this market unless we can really deal with that. But equally, what we don't want to see is excessive regulation which restricts choice and puts the consumer almost last. If a consumer wants to buy a negative-only fund, they should have every right to do so. But that may be harder under EU taxonomy. So there's lots to think about. Thanks, Neville. And finally, we'll hear from Eva from Aberdeen Standard Investments. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Eva Cairns. I work in the central ESG team up in Edinburgh at Aberdeen Standard Investments. Um, and Neville's already <coughs> talked about the drivers and how people think this is um, a really big issue that advisors need to understand. And I think we very clearly see that regulation is coming that will put that pressure on advisors to, to talk to clients about ESG and that client preferences are shifting and that the, the younger generation is demanding to understand with their investments what impact that has um, and, and to think about ESG and, and sustainability really proactively. So I think the drivers are really, really clear. Um, we did a survey ourselves of consumers last year that showed the top two ESG themes that came up were human rights and climate change. And um, the way we're structured, we have a central ESG team and we have um, dedication to specific topics. I mean, half the team is focused on governance. Um, it doesn't get as much exciting publicity as the <laughs> E side, but it's actually core to understand how corporates are governed and structured and their board and their pay um, and their independence. 
Um, and on the ENS side, we have people dedicated to specific research topics. I'm focused on climate change, so my talk is slightly biased towards that. But there's others in the team that do human rights, labor, uh, business ethics and um, corruption, and also other environmental responsibility, such as biodiversity, circular economy. Um, they are interlinked, and we all sit together and work with each other. But what that allows us to do with the scale of that team and the company is to really do that deep dive research into these topics and provide that insight to the fund managers. And this is all part of um, our ESG integration uh, process. What I wanted to talk about today is to really differentiate between products and sustainability driven products um, and a process that for us applies to all of our funds and all of our investment decisions across the, the mainstream funds. Um, and, and that's what we see as ESG integration as a process where we need to think about how do the investments that we have in our portfolios, how are they at risk of uh, ESG factors, but also how can they benefit from something, from being a leader. So from our perspective, it's not just ESG risk, it's also the opportunities that come with that. If you manage these risks really well and establish yourself well um, as a leader, as a first mover in a certain area. So um, in climate change, for example, my responsibility is to look at the different sectors, look at the different regions and see what risks are most material, which is a huge task because when I started doing that, I found that all sectors, all regions have some exposure um, to climate change, whether that is due to regulation, due to technology changes, um, or due to the, the, the location and the vulnerability to physical impacts such as flooding, droughts, sea level rises. So, and that has absolutely an impact on um, the ability to generate financial return. If we don't think about that and have hold companies that um, are not managing these ESG risks. So the first thing as part of our uh, ESG integration approach is to understand that exposure company by company, sector by sector. Um, and then to understand how that exposure is being managed. And that's where the active stewardship and engagement approach comes in and that we find is, is really powerful and influential. And again, a, a company of our size has got the people and the resources to build really long-term strong relationships with companies um, and engage with them and really look beyond what is in the public domain and what they say in their, uh, in their reports to understand how are they managing ESG related risks and opportunities to position themselves well for the future. Um, and that absolutely we believe has an impact on financial return. So it's not that we say you need to sacrifice financial return to do something good. It's a, it's a key part of the investment decision that is, has an impact on, on those returns. Um, and so engagement is absolutely key, key to that process. And, and we meet with companies and not just with their um, investor relation departments, but with CEOs and, and C-level executives to influence, to challenge, and to have those conversations regularly, because it won't happen in one meeting, um, to, to have a seat at the table. And so that's, that's what I wanted to get across in terms of ESG integration and engagement is a process across all of our funds. And when you look at a fund manager, um, things that, that can reflect the strength of that ESG integration policy is just how, how the ESG team is embedded within the investment function and not just part of a, a marketing function, um, and how the, um, how the ESG policy is integrated into practice and whether there's really some thought leadership and research that's been published, data that, that is being used that shows that we're really actively thinking about this. So, one example is an internal ESG score that we have that we, we developed ourselves with different quadrants on the topics of importance and we score every company out of 100 with that score, which is just an initial indication. It gives you an initial starting point to then do a deep dive um, through more research and engagement. And then on the other hand, the products um, that we have that are sustainability driven, as we call the whole bucket, and you could split into, into two categories, ones that are more traditionally ethical products that focus on negative screening, so you exclude the bad ones you don't want to hold, um, and the other ones where you include the good ones. Uh, and, and that's really where we're seeing a shift and we want to, um, and, and we think that is really powerful to focus on companies that have a positive impact 
um, on the environment, on, on society. And the challenge is how we measure that, how we include those companies. We had those debates earlier. We talk about impact, what does that really mean? Um, and, and our approach for those types of uh, products is to bring in the sustainable development goals and to align our framework with that and to look at sustainable and, uh, development goals are not just about climate change, access to education, financial inclusion, um, um, food security. So what are companies doing? And are they just not just saying it, but actually getting revenue from from those types of products and services and measuring the actual impact in terms of access given to people uh, in remote areas to, to certain services that they need. So this is the type of impact assessment that then is really looking at how a company is making a positive difference. And this is in our product um, in our product area. So, so this is very specific to these types of funds that we have. And the range goes all the way from ethical to um, SRI and sustainable development funds to, to the impact funds where measurement is a lot more difficult. That's me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that useful summary from everyone. Um, so now I'd like to open it up to the floor. Does anybody have a question for one or all of our panelists? Yes, thanks. Do you find that screening uh, is evolving? Uh, and what's, what, what have you seen as the changes? Mm. The That's great. Yes, um, and in fact within our own process, it's evolved a lot over the last two years, partly because I think some of the sophistication of the thinking you're bringing to what you're doing has had to improve but I've also increased the size of my team and they brought new ideas in. So for instance, our process is based on a template and a traffic light system, so we don't have an internal rating as you do, um, but the traffic light system builds up all the data points towards a conclusion. The climate change section was missing on that two years ago. There's now a very detailed climate change section based mostly on CDP, but then evolving again to link it to science-based targets and what risks and opportunities the company faces. And all of this builds up the picture as to whether you would hold it or not, in terms of, sorry, recommend holding it or not. So yes, it's, it's, it's evolving a lot, and every day we can think of new things we should put in. And in a sense, the only thing that restricts us from that is just the, the plethora of information that could go in. We try to stick to familiar and um, consistent data points, partly so that we can measure things against you know, peer groups and sectors, um, but, but also because we're companies, you, you've got a really good performing company like Unilever, where there is so much information, you've got to make judgments about what goes in. But yeah, I think screening is evolving, and um, we've seen that very much in our own process. A lot of it, I think, is still invisible, because we, we publish a lot about our process, but not the underlying templates. So I think there is still some transparency and visibility so that you and underlying clients really understand what managers are doing. When you say, why do you hold X? There's an awful lot that lies behind it. And I think the increasing sophistication of that is, is there now, yeah. And I think to add to that, the improvement of data availability on specific issues really helps and enables you to improve that screening. So traditionally you would look at involvement in certain industries or in certain topics that you wanted to in, uh, exclude and so that involvement would kind of screen something out. Whereas now for example um, when we are revamping our internal ESG score we were very specifically saying okay these things are backward looking or something that you know is, is actually what, what we really want to understand is a more forward-looking view. How can we get data into a screening exercise that is more forward-looking and that tells us something about the strategy of the company um, and how they, how they are positioned against peers. So there is, and, and we do use MSCI as well, and they do provide, for example, data that you can use that says, um, you know, are the targets set for climate change um, ambitious compared to the industry? Are they starting from a high level and it's really ambitious? So you get a lot more sophistication around the data points that you can use for screening that give you a forward-looking view. Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think disclosures improved and historically that's been part of why at the small and medium-sized company end of the market there hasn't been much interest in, in it. The first thing was if you don't have a disclosure, which a lot of these companies don't, it is improving, but um, they stay well away from it, which is why we have that third, I suppose, third layer of the process for us in meeting the management teams and trying to get as much out of them as we can. Thank you. <coughs> I was just going to ask 
Yes. On the, on the liberal fund, do you have a separate sort of responsible investment team, or is there a head of responsible investment within the business, or is it just? Yeah, we've yeah. we've got an ethical officer, Alex Game. He is um, he's within he is a fund manager, but not on the the income fund, and the his input into uh, the ethical income fund is is sort of on a on a standalone basis. Um, he calls us to account, and he also liaises with the companies, the investee companies, to to get the information he requires from. Them. So yeah, it's a, it's a separate function, and and he can veto anything within the fund. Um, as the data improves that you uh, mentioned, does that mean that over time um, you could have less of an edge over, say, a passive strategy in the space? Always active, always going to be one step ahead of what the uh, great agency. question. <laughs> This is, this is going to be the Mandy Rice Davis answer. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, because we're active managers, we passionately believe that this lends itself to qualitative research. You can use data providers. We use a data provider to provide you with a lot of efficiencies. But at the end of the day, we don't use quants. We don't use anything like that, algorithms. We believe it's a qualitative process in which people make judgments about long term. Um, so we've been relatively outspoken you would say that, around the ability to call yourself a passive responsibility fund um, where there's probably little engagement, no governance. You know, it's perfectly acceptable if people want to buy that. It's no problem. But it could be part of the confusion, again, in suggesting that ETFs and passive funds have the same credibility in terms of the depth of thinking that the people who do it actively do. But I realise you may say, well, he would say that. You know. <laughs> we just don't think it lends itself to passives, really. Yeah, I, I would add as well that the, the key differentiator is really that strength of engagement that we have on the active side um, and the relationship with the companies. And we do have around um, 10 to 15% of our AUM in quants that are more passive. And what that team is starting to do is, and I think it's good that they're evolving because that's what needs to happen and they, it, it'd be great to see that passive passively managed fund are also um, starting to compare themselves to different benchmarks, for example. So that's what we started to explore in that team, to use benchmarks that are more, there's a lot of them that are, that are emerging out there now, that are more climate tilted or whatever the name is that, that they pick, so that you're actually tracking something that is um, better. And from our point of view, we have the, the main income fund. 20% um, of that drops out when it goes through the ethical process. Only a third of that drops out through what would be caught up in a passive <laughs> process, and, and, and two thirds requires the active element of, of what we do. But I suppose, just to add a final point, as you will be aware, the entire industry is under enormous pressure to reduce fees. And so, what was once seen as a kind of premium instrument within the market, you have all this as well as your fund management is now almost being seen as business as usual, and that puts enormous pressure on small players um, who just don't have the scale, but nevertheless are trying to do it through an active process. So again, we have the challenges of, of fee pressure, um, where we really do believe in the active management approach, but where clearly clients are also looking for competitive deals. Well, I will uh, throw open a question to the panel that I asked in the first session this morning, which is, in a way, the strategies that we're specifically discussing here, i.e. ESG integration, stewardship and, and screening, have been seen as the kind of traditional strategies adopted by the, the space. Um, and some of the criticism that is levelled in this area, not just now, but, but um, sort of traditionally as well, is you know, how different, you, you say you're adopting these strategies, how different does your fund holdings, if you looked at the top 10 holdings, if you looked at all of the holdings, how different does it look to a fund that is maybe not employing these strategies? So, you know, obviously you can answer from a, from a sort of fund level or from your organisation level or more, make a more general comment, but I think it's quite an interesting question for each of you to I can touch kick off and briefly you. say what I said this morning, <laughs> that um, at the end of the day we would have across the different sectors what we like to focus on because of that active ESG integration approach is that 
the, the companies that we hold in those sectors are the ones with the uh, best in class, if you want to call it that, ESG profile, because we have thought about how are companies managing ESG risks and opportunities, um, and, and therefore have a preference for having the stronger ESG players in that, in that fund, in, uh, across all funds. Well, um, yeah, I, I don't think I need to add really to the kind of points I made in terms of the things we fail, the way we look at it. Um, but equally, I think, you know, my core point is we really firmly believe passionately that the way businesses are run is important and material to long-term performance. And I think the danger of the debate around sustainability is not sustainability itself. But if you only look at that, you could have some perverse outcomes in which you could. This is a stark example invest in a wind farm that is planted in the Amazon forest and clears people off of it. That's a stark example, but it's a great example actually of where the sustainability forgets the wider environmental and social impact of the company running the wind farm. So I think that's why we harmonise the two and try to get long-term performance from you know, qualitative, responsible and sustainable businesses. Yeah, and I think with, with our funds, you know, all the funds we run at Unicorn are highly differentiated, very, very high conviction funds. With the ethical income fund, it sits in a sector of around 100 funds. Most of them invest in large cap names. There's a big over-reliance in the UK for, for income from large caps. Um, so straight away, our, our mainstream income fund is very differentiated. If you remove some stocks, it goes down to even higher conviction list, and clearly, it's, you know, compared to the, the majority of the people, it's very, very differentiated. Great, thank you. Is regulation helping or hinder you? Sustainability journey, or would you ask your regulators for and all trade bodies? Can you say that again? So, is what regulators? Sorry. regulators. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much I can say. We've been very lucky um, to have had several meetings with the FCA because they're doing an enormous amount of work on this. I think the dilemma for the regulator is they understand absolutely all of the problems and challenges we've talked about, but it's fair to say that their predisposition was just to apply the EU taxonomy. And I did a session, Simon isn't in the room, he was in earlier, Chief, Chief Executive of UCSIF and other parties, m g were with us, in which we did a teach-in to the FCA, in which you could see their faces visibly going white, because what we were showing was a much more complex world than they were perhaps willing to admit. So we're hoping that they're going to go back and re-examine this, because what we said, two things I've said today, don't affect the vibrancy, make choice still the number one priority, but make fund managers accountable. If you launch a sustainability fund, you have to define what that means and what's in it. Um, but don't actually corral people into a taxonomy which is purely focused on climate change or sustainability. That does affect our business model, um, will probably affect yours because of your, you know, your ethical bias. And I think this is troubling because clients need to have the full range of choice but need to understand fully what they're buying in an informed way. So regulators can at the moment be, they could be a hindrance, but we're hoping, based on those conversations, that they're going to be enablers. The only other thing to say is there are at least four or five different parts of the FCA working on this, and they seem unable to talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. In some areas, uh, it would definitely be helpful to have... Um, from my perspective, when we talk about data disclosure and actually having that transparency of data, if there was some stronger regulation around that becoming a standard. Um, again, I'm talking from a climate climate perspective and where we're looking sometimes for things like um, there's a there's a wonderful Paris aligned strategy, but actually there's no disclosure on where capital expenditure is going to make that happen. And some of the things we'd help to just be really clear about what we you know, from regulators to very clearly see what is the minimum expected on disclosure. But in other areas, like you mentioned the taxonomy, um, and we met with, uh, with the EU to discuss that, and we just thought that's not going to help us. We're doing it differently, and it's just going to be confusing. And we thought of it, you know, it, it was just uh, slightly hindering in that, in that way, because if we all then have to adjust to something that is becoming a standard, um, yeah. It feels just like they want to create a commodity so it's, rather it's, than a vibrant It's quite market, a tricky balance between mm. finding consistency but also giving flexibility mm. to differentiate and to meet different needs uh, in, in that way when we're trying to standardise something. So do you think um, equivalent EFG is helping or hindering Sorry, I've just started talking in after this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there is a European template of disclosure. 
if there was a European template for ESG, would that help you as a fund manager to cut through and provide binary information? Could you provide it for advisors and then would you provide it to advisors if, if, or would you have to be regulated to provide that? I think I think everyone's keen to be as transparent as possible if, if they're to going about it with best intentions. Um, a template, just the, you, you've seen here the three very different approaches. That, yeah, a, 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 a sort of national or international wide template just might not lend itself to that. Uh, but I just think the key is transparency. Mm. Well, there's Dean, I mean, Oxif has also previously done, so the UK Sustainable Investment and Finance Association has done a lot of work around templates around certain initiatives about sort of standardizing the information that's provided and also looking at I mean it, it sort of regularly comes up the idea of a kite mark and I think the 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 concern <coughs> there has always been that there's just not a one size fits all approach yeah. and when I, I've seen some interesting work done on a sort of hypothetical so hypothetically this is what the template would look like, hypothetically, this is what the kite mark would look like. And in every single instance of that, we've been able to say, people in the industry have been able to say, okay, well, this is an example where that doesn't fit, it doesn't fit into it. So there's a problem. And then there's the problem of the vibrancy and the innovation in that it, it could stifle innovation. So I think, you know, that's an issue. So I think um, I'll ask one more question of the panel as well. Um, I've seen so, an, an article today and some articles that have been coming up because obviously it's, it's Good Money Week and there's been a lot of information um, about uh, green and ethical funds in particular. So as organisations who we would hope um, do things well um, and are transparent, um, what advice would you give to the audience um, you know, as, as sort of representatives of their clients for what to look out for now that we are noticing that there might be uh, newer funds or, or people trying to tailor their approach, sort of uh, the greenwashing accusation, I suppose you could say, or, or trying to tailor proactively fitting their fund information towards, you know, we do address the SDGs, for example, which is one, uh, one case that I've noticed. So, you know, do you have any tip? But what would you look out for? What we've, we've heard, you know, looking at like where does the ESG team sit? Do you have a dedicated ESG person or responsible investment person? Is there anything else that you'd like to add, like what to look out for to make sure this is being done in a robust manner? I mean, from our perspective, I mentioned the structure and how mm. you, the team ESG is embedded within within the company. Um, and also then what the what will be probably ready readily available what the company publishes in terms of their ESG integration policy and some of the products that they have in terms of their sustainability product offering and to try and understand how that actually see what they're doing that is adding value whether they're doing some thought leadership themselves data developments around ESG themselves um, to, to really not just um, say we're doing all that but actually have resources that are focused on ESG um, and I think that is yeah I think that's key there's other things that you can look at which is engagement and voting track records mm -hmm. that's generally publicly available so you actually see how active companies are in the engagement and how many um, shareholder resolutions presented to the AGMs they have supported so again that's an indication of um, um, practicing what they, what they preach. Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, we would love more questions on how we vote. It's the Cinderella part of this whole process, but it's absolutely key and core to whether you finally invest in a good company. But I think it comes down to people and process. You know, where does the team sit? How many? What the competencies and skills? Are they empowered to lead? What are they engaging on? Um, and then the process and be really being able to understand and drill down into the, the small parts of the process so you really understand that this product you expect to buy for your clients is the one that meets their needs. But I suppose sitting over top of that is you understanding your clients and what their needs are, but feeling confident to be able to talk the language so that you can steer them uh, depending on what their, their needs are and then find the right products based on all of this that, uh, that we kind of set out. Yeah, I think from our point of view, you nowhere know, around right, a small firm, we don't have the QGI resource that our other asset managers have to, to throw at this. But I would hope people look into investing our fund would look for 
you know, the policy we have in place, the approach we take, and maybe we apply that strictly and actually don't just give a lip service, but do what we say we do. Mm. <coughs> well, I suppose an open question is in terms of looking at specifically ESG integration, stewardship and ethics and the learning around this session, which is about, you know, how can this help intermediaries meet clients' sort of personal aims and opinions? Do you have any thoughts on how specific strategies do sort of map onto what we're seeing now in terms of people's sort of new wants and needs for, for how their money is kind of making the world a better place? Um, yeah, it feels like that that's pretty much what, what we've been talking about for mm. the last mm. um, half an hour here, that there's, um, if, if clients have very specific objectives to actually look at um, a specific sustainable product range whether those objectives are driven by we definitely do not want to invest in this looking for funds that offer this negative screening or those that say we're absolutely keen to have an impact with our money on the environment or on reducing inequality and there's, there's mm -hmm. lots of different um, impact related funds that then enable them to do that um, and again if clients say I don't really need to put money into a specific fund with a different objective I do want to maximize my financial financial return but I want to make sure that ESG is part of that then the ESG integration process should be core of, of a fund because what's the alternative that what would a fund look like where you don't think about Not ESG constrained. so yeah I think I'm going to make a slight just a slightly different point and something that we've not talked about and that is we've all talked about positively investing, the things we will invest in, trying to make the world a better place. One thing fund managers are really terrible at is, is owning up to divestment or even acknowledging that it exists. And I have this curious feeling that actually if we said more about the things we won't do, that we've actively divested from, you would have more confidence in us. And I think that's, I don't know why that's a problem for the industry because divestment seems to be it's the last possible thing you will do is that you're clinging with your fingertips to the edge of the cliff with somebody stamping on them just so you can continue to invest in BP until the final moment and I think that is a real problem for the industry in this part where I think you are looking for us to have a holistic process and so not only wants to say positively what we invest in but actually the decisions we take where we want to divest and we, we've divested from a lot of companies actually in the last few years which we've not been particularly um, vocal about it's just not something we seem to be able to talk about but I'd be interested in your views about you know do you see that from fund managers because I think that would be a more powerful tool we have if we just I mean we've just divested from Centrica on ethical grounds which is an unusual stock to divest from on ethical grounds but we don't talk about that. It's kind of the thing we don't talk about. It's like I said in the previous workshop, we need these stories to start filtering through. Yeah. To, you know, what's happening in, in the back office of the analyst? You know, what, what's, what are you picking up and what are you divesting on? But I think as well, the advice industry, for want of a better word, is its own worst enemy because I pick up a lot of clients who said, oh, well, my IFA says don't invest ethically because you won't get the... Um, you won't get the today, you won't get the performance. And I think that's the first thing that we start breaking down. Yeah. Yeah. I think the D the D word is a real problem for us. Yeah. Alright. We've been gonged. Let's let's do the transfer. Thank you very much and thank you to the panel. Thank you.